my name is Colin Yeager. I'm a professor of English at Rutgers and the director of the Center for Cultural Analysis, which is the sponsor for this event. Every year, the CCA sponsors a year-long research seminar on a topic of general interdisciplinary interest. This year, our theme is the commons. We have had several distinguished visitors come to speak with us over the course of the year. And today, we're so very pleased to welcome Silvia Federici. For more than four decades, Silvia has been an activist, educator, scholar, and teacher at Hofstra University, but also around the world. She has defined as her own the space where feminism, Marxism, and the commons intersect and overlap. And in a series of books and countless articles, she has shaped the conversation in those fields in profound and lasting ways. You know the titles, but I will read some of them here. Taliban and the Witch, Revolution at Point Zero, Reenchanting the World, Feminism and the Politics of the Commons. Equally important and in line with this intellectual work, Sylvia is a dedicated activist, a founder of Wages for Housework, a longtime member of the Midnight Notes Collective and of the Committee for Academic Freedom in Africa, and a tireless advocate for women, for feminism, for land and community, and for basic human de decency the world over. So with that, Sylvia, I will turn things over to you. Good afternoon and uh, apologies you know, for, for the delay. Um, yes, and thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I'm in, my, in this uh, brief uh, you know, comment that I'm going to make, uh, I want to stress on two issues. You know, one is why you know, I became interested in the commons. And second, you know, why the issue of the commons becomes so prominent in the recent time. I was introduced to the idea of communal um, ownership and communal lands when I was working on Caliban and the Witch. And uh, in the process, of course, uh, I began with the Middle Ages and I realized that throughout the Middle Ages in the feudal economy, you know, all work was collective. In the village, in the village economy that grew around the great feudal estate, you know, uh, basically uh, work, work activities in the fields and other spheres of reproduction were very collective. And this uh, created also a culture of resistance, a capacity for resistance that in fact, by the 15th century was leading to peasant wars. You know, these were peasants and they were confronting the military apparatus of the feudal lords. And nevertheless, and I realized that this had a lot to do you know, with this um, collectivity, with this uh, strength that came from that from collective relation. Later on, I had the fortune of spending time in Africa in the 1980s and realizing, first of all, that uh, much of African land was still uh, you know, uh, cultivated collectively and managed collectively. And again, confronting and learning from the kind of the, seeing a, a, a strong difference in the culture, seeing that this collective management of the land is surviving communalism, which in some parts of Africa, especially West Africa, you know, had survived through the colonial period. Land was never expropriated, communal land massively was not expropriated as in the East or in the South, in South Africa, you know, so, in Nigeria, the culture was very much you know, permeated by, by communal principles. And at the very same time, you know, I realized coming back in the, in the US, looking at the inter growing international debates, uh, I realized that uh, communalism was actually becoming a common issue. And this brings me to the second question, you know, why? You know why uh, you know communalism has become so important. I'm so sorry for this phone. Today is a particular day for me, so I'm, I'm lots of things are happening around me that I not predicted. So um, why why communalism has become? I mean, for for the reason first of all that uh, um, I had already begun to observe in in Nigeria where I had been and then other parts of Africa, which is 
because the commons, the remaining commons across the planet had begun, had come under an increasing attack. You know, the restructuring of the global economy uh, starting in the 1980s, the expansion of capitalist relation to areas and region where they had not had so much an impact, you know, previously, you know, basically uh, saw a major, major war on the commons, which is still going on, you know, war by, you know, a variety of uh, um, capitalist forces, you know, mining company, petroleum, agribusiness, you know, even, even uh, the, the, the companies that are producing, uh, you know, the green gasoline, you know, they are in fact, you know, enclosing land. So realized very early in Nigeria and then this became more common that we are facing, that we have been facing since the 1980 with the restructuring of the global economy, a new process of enclosure, a new massive process of displacement, clearances, people expelled, and in fact, the massive, massive migration processes that we have seen, you know, in uh, over the last decades, you know, are a direct result of those new enclosures. You know, once again, the world proletariat, the, the peasant is being taken away from the ancestral land. So this is one reason. Another reason, of course, has been the final collapse of, uh, of communism. You know, whatever hopes were attached to the, the communist idea, I think uh, that, uh, you know, that chapter after the fall of the Berlin Wall, et cetera, was, was closed. And so the idea of another revolutionary principle, another vision, the necessity for another vision. And with that also, you know, uh, in particular, in response to the new enclosure that very often have been directed against the land of indigenous people. You know, we have seen a resurgence, a resurgence of interest in the struggle of indigenous people, a resurgence of struggle of, of, of uh, you know, Native American and, and uh, indigenous Aboriginal community ac across the world, beginning with the Zapatistas. You know? So all these reasons are still very much there, are still very much there, they're, they're, they're still facing this condition. If anything, the process of enclosure is more brutal than ever. You know, extractivism is now the main, uh, the main enemy the communities across the world are facing, and uh, deforestation, privatization of land. So the question of the commons today, you know, has become a ground that brings together different social movements, feminist, feminist, ecological, um, you know, and, and, uh, and also all kinds of uh, left movements, indigenous, of course, Obviously, a set of reasons came together whereby, you know, between 1980 and the present, because I think the issue of the commons is very, very present. And for me, you know, coming from the reading of, of uh, um, Caliban and the Witch, then my experience in Africa, seeing commons in Africa, then, of course, you know, the, the whole issue confronting the issue of new enclosure. I was work of a collective, you know, called Midnight Notes. And in 1990, we put out an issue called the new enclosure. The way we looked at the fact that, yes, we are confronting something very similar, you know, in its dynamic and in its results to what Marx, you know, uh, studied and described you know, in the last chapter of volume one of Capital, we were witnessing the new enclosure and these new massive movements of people. And I was particularly inspired, and here I will conclude, I was particularly inspired by some of the literature that was beginning to emerge from feminists. Feminists like Vandana Shiva, feminists like uh, Maria Mies, you know, who has spent many years in, in India, right, who were beginning to see through the issue of the commons, also the connection between the feminist movement and the ecological movement. 
and beginning to see that uh, you know, the, we have to think of more collective cooperative forms of reproduction, more collective cooperative forms of reproduction. And this is the work that uh, in a way I've been doing uh, for the last few years, also very inspired, not only by you know, visions of the future, you know, because to me, the commons, it's a principal organization of society. You know, there is the alternative that I can see to capitalism, you know, but also by the implementation, the realization of this principle you know, in many community of Latin America, especially Latin America. And uh, what does it mean, the commons? And with this, I conclude. You know, commons means, uh, you know, is a principal organization of a society, you know, where the resources, where the, 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 the wealth that is produced, as well as the nature of wealth, it's shared, you know, where work is cooperative, is collaborative, where decision making, where we recuperate not only land and access to water, air, forests, but we recuperate the decision making. But that decision making is collective. It's for the common good. And, uh, and I think that this is the vision that we need to bring with us in whatever struggle we make. And it is a vision that allow us, I think, and this is very, very important, allow us to organize in a way where our protest, our struggle to change the world is not only oppositional, but in a way begins to construct, starting from the present, the society that it wants to build. And so this, the idea of the commons is that not something projected in a distant future, but to use Marx's work, you know, is the movement that each day transform through our struggle and our practices, the world in which we live. I wondered if you could say some more about the dependence of capital on the commons and what we might do actively to prevent uh, the capture uh, of the commons uh, going forward, the way yeah. it seems to have done with new media. There has been such a, as in other areas too, as in area, I, I watch it now, particularly in relation to the question of witchcraft. You know, witchcraft has now been appropriated even by the fashion, by there is a whole commodification. And the same thing with the commons. So we began to see with the World Bank and the United Nations, we came to see this process of appropriation. You know, the idea that they are cities, they are heritage of humanity. And therefore we need the commons used to defend the notion that there should be this supranational organization, this global organization, which in fact represent international capital. Right, but that this global organization have the right to represent humanity. The common is exactly the opposite. The common is the idea that actually people regain the capacity to make the decisions that are most important on their life. And in fact, there is a very vibrant discussion internationally as to how we do that so that we don't create this large structure where once again. We are alienated from this decision and how we can organize ways of interconnectivity so the different communities in which people are fully participant can still work in a unison, right? Instead, the World Bank, and so, so the World Bank launches the idea of the global commons. The global commons has been the way to actually turn the notion of the common upside down to basically say that the way to defend it, A, this organization of the great defenders, and B, the way to defend you know, the commonwealth is to put a price to it, is to put a price to it. So you, you now, you know, the World Bank appropriates 
huge forest or, or grazing land that once belonged you know, to commoners, to indigenous community, et cetera. And now they turn them into places like for safaris, et cetera, you know, where only a select group of people, those with money, this presumably is a way to protect them, right? So this idea of, the, of a, is in fact, really there is a great danger here, right? And we have also seen the use of the concept. You know, now when I go to the universities, you know, uh, before or later I see the commons, right? Uh, even though these are places that people access, you know, by paying substantial amount of money. The commons, the place where you eat, the commons is the library, et cetera, et cetera. So we have to be very careful, right? And there is the other danger is what I call the gated commons. The gated commons are places where, where you know, people organize collectively their life, but on a principle of exclusion, on a principle not of reciprocity, but on a principle of exclusion. So coming together on the basis of religious uh, belief, political belief, income, mostly about income, you know, to protect yourself from others. And because people realize that in uh, sociality, there are certain advantages. So commons are not gated community, which does not mean they are the free range. It does not mean they are a, a place where anybody can go and take and, uh, and participate. There are principles that should be, and in fact, there have been historically principles for the commons which means that you have to give back as well as to take, right? You have to give back. There is a very powerful book. And in fact, I'm going to show it that I don't know, probably you've read it because it's been very popular by Kimmerer, uh, Braiding the Sweet Grass, right? And, uh, you know, I mention it because she's one of those authors who have stressed over and over and over and over the agency of nature, you know, the fact that nature gives us, gives us not only sustenance, but knowledge, that we have to listen to nature and that the relation to nature cannot be only one of taking, you know, taking the strawberries, you taking the mice, the mice, you no, know, but has to be also one of caring, of returning uh, and, uh, these are the principles, you know, that anyone who wants to be a commoner has to be observing, right? And uh, so commoner means a uh, uh, community, not only of people, but also with the land, also with animals. And uh, these are, this uh, is uh, the discussion now. What do we need to know so that there's not being a manipulation and an exploitation of this concept? Um, thank you so much for the readings, and uh, they're very, very fascinating, and um, for raising this issue of the commons. I've, I admit to some ambivalence about it, however, um, and that, that has to do with um, kind of seeing, seeing them in operation, I guess, um, and that on one hand, I see from my work in Ghana how important access to land is as a social safety net in the absence of other you know, the state provision of it that people essentially can always go back to their hometown and they can get access to land on which to grow some food. And this is really, really important for women um, if they separate from their husbands or if they go through some kind of crisis, they can always go home and be assured of a tiny plot of land on which to, to grow food. But I'm also, I also feel like the commons is a major site for women's exploitation. Um, and so, and here I'm thinking about the domestic sphere and families, and maybe this is part of what you were just saying about how do we, const how do we construct a commons that is um, fair, where there isn't freeloading, where there is, where it when doesn't only give, but one also receives. Um, but I just wonder what your, what your thoughts are on this issue for yeah. 
Very, very, very important. In fact, you know, my article about, uh, you know, women and the reconstruction of the commons, you know, in Africa and the issue of land, it's really directed, you know, to your question. Because, uh, you know, clearly, you know, there's so much that has to be thought through and learned. And one, of course, is what were the commons, you know, before the advent of capitalism. And I think uh, that uh, often, you know, the situation, the pre-capitalist situation of indigenous people has been presented in very utopian land, in very utopian terms. And now, for instance, in several parts of Latin America, you know, there's been a lot of work done to moderate that the concept to say that in a number of places, you know, hierarchy, gender hierarchy did still exist, although not as pronounced and not organized on the same basis as later in capitalism, but some sort of division of labor that was still somewhat discriminating. But all of this to say that, first of all, what we call today commons and commons land have gone through phase and phase and phase of colonialism, of impact of uh, you know, capitalist culture and economics and political economic relation, right? So the impact of Christianity, for instance, in Africa, you know, all extremely divisive from the point of view and extremely devaluing of women devaluing of women's work. So what the commons that we look at today, for example, in Africa, is certainly not a model, right? Even though there's still something we can learn from it when we look at their history. But certainly does not mean, okay, this is the model. There's no going back to the past. I think that the, the conception of model as a political principle today, right? Uh, is something that is to be constructed. It's something that is to be constructed. It's not a going back, right? But it has to be constructed. Secondly, there couldn't be one model. There couldn't be one model because uh, there are different historical, cultural, geographical trajectories. So that's also very important. Right? That we now don't think there is one model of the commons. But in terms of the question of relationship, inequalities between men and women, this is a very, very important issue. Because for instance, when you look at Latin America, you know, in a lot of places that are considered communal, that are communal, uh, there are uh, inequalities. Uh, in some places, extreme cases, women are not allowed to participate in the assemblies. There are assemblies, the decision are made collectively, but the women are excluded, right? In other places, Gladys Tsutsur, who is an anthropologist and sociologist, has written about it. Very, very powerful book, extremely powerful. Uh, the land belongs to all, but then is also transmitted, you know, into clans through a uh, male line. Mm -hmm. And so often women, if they marry outside of a particular grouping, they might find themselves excluded. So there are problems with the present commons, right? And uh, they should not be seen as the blueprint for what, you know, uh, is to be constructed for the future. However, however, and this is really where the, the politics, the battle today is, Right? And, and this was the point of the article that I wrote, which I wrote on the basis of a lot of discussion with other women and women from Africa and Latin America. The point is that these inequality today are being used in the name of feminism. They are being used to encourage privatization and individual titling, right? So for example, one battle in Africa, you know, in the context of the titling, which is a World Bank project, right? Giving individual title, break up the common, 
change change the land tenure laws, change the tenure laws, discredit the law of the commons, and then give individual title. And the struggle for many women has been to get to have a title, not only the man should have a title to the land, but the woman should have a title. Another struggle has been to change the law in such a way that the land is privatized. So there are a group of women with very neoliberally minded who basically think, forget it. You know, the only way to create some equality is to privatize the land and to basically give everybody access. However, and this was the point of my article, right? This is where the struggle, because it, this notion, the privatization can in any way guarantee a modicum of equality, it's really faulty. In reality, what it does is that it gives women with money it gives women who have access to profession, they have access to, to income, to a high level of income, the capacity to buy land and further expropriate, right? And in the article that I uh, introduced, I was counterposing two different models of struggle for land rights, a kind of neoliberal feminist model that basically says, Privatization does away with the inequalities that exist now in the management of communal lands, right? The other says, no, let's take over the land. You know, we is a, is a movement of women that at present, right, is defending the commons and trying to change, you know, fighting to change, you know, communal principle as they are organized. And at the same time, they are immediately turned into action. The moment they are, you know, uh, expropriated and they have to urbanize, wherever they are in the cities, they take over land. Any piece of land that is not used, they might take it over and plant something, right? And this is a movement that has begun in Africa but there's later spread in different parts of the world. You know, everywhere now, those who have been uh, displaced, forced to urbanize, but come from indigenous tradition, come from a history of uh, basically finding their nourishment from the land and now taking over land. And uh, so there's been a spread of urban farming as a result of the new enclosure. Right? So this is so, you know, one point that I've been driving and is not my own because I heard women saying that is that in fact, you know, gender-based inequalities uh, are a danger to the common, particularly today when a certain kind of feminism is used and uh, presumably to guarantee equality, to guarantee equal access. Whereas in fact, it is the opposite. The moment you have privatization, immediately hierarchies, right? And, uh, and this is also a situation that is very, very critical. Very, very, very critical because especially in Africa, but not only in Africa, Latin America, the land, and when I mean land, I mean everything. Land is soil, rivers, ponds, forests, animals, grazing ground, uh, the grass, the land is so under attack. It's so under attack. I mean, Saudi Arabia has bought thousands and thousands of hectares of land in Ethiopia. We now speak of all the big struggle between the Tigray and it's never mentioned why the, why the, the, the for example, you know, it is never mentioned that the amount of land available to the people in Ethiopia has shrunk immensely because they've sold it to, to, to Saudi Arabia, you know, and everywhere there's been an encroachment on the land, communal and otherwise. So under this condition, 
on the ground in the peasant community, there is a deadly struggle. There is a deadly struggle that, for example, has resulted also in witch hunting. And here there is a whole other chapter which has to do with the, you know, uh, the new missionaries, you know, they, they are coming with the conquistadores. <laughs> the, with the IMF and the World Bank, now you have, uh, you know, evangelical, you know, the pastors of uh, evangelical organization, you know, were coming with their tales of witchcraft and Satan, and all of this plays into the land, you know, into the relation to the land. You know, so that is now common to hear that if an old woman, poor woman inherits land in Africa, she's in danger of being killed. She's in danger of being accused of being a witch, at least in a number of countries, including Ghana, where you have concentration camps for women accused of witchcraft all through the north. You have thousands of women, older women, who had to flee their village in fear of their lives. This is happening today. And they are surviving on pittance given by humanitarian organization. But the money is managed by these chiefs, right? Who basically are the ones who allow people to go in into the camp or not go in into the camp. And uh, this is the situation. And I always say the responsibility, of course, is with the international relations, the international companies who are creating this thing. This is the new colonialism. This is the new process of colonization. You, know, you, you can have your independent flag, but actually you know, when the financial system and uh, you know, the manipulation of money, the debt crisis, structural adjustment, all of that, it's been a way to recolonize. It's been a way to give corporation privileged access to the land of Africa. This is the danger that we are meeting today. So the defense of the commons is really the defense. Uh, it's a project, a, an anti-colonial struggle. And, uh, and it's a struggle for the defense of the ecology, of African ecology. So when we speak of commons, we speak about also a struggle to defend the forest, to defend the land, to defend the rivers, right? And it's a struggle yeah, for uh, those subjects like majority of women who are not included, who are still at the margin or outside of the monetary relations, you know? And uh, around the struggle has all these different dimensions. Somebody commented in the chat earlier about Medicare for all, and so it just got me thinking about federal policy. And I know you write about sort of the um, the crisis of the state form and um, the limitations of the state as an avenue to uh, practicing the commons. And you also write about sort of the power of direct action in constructing the commons. And so I guess I'm wondering, um, if you do see a role for federal socialist style policymaking um, in the construction of the commons, and if so, what that role um, might be. Thanks. Yeah, no, actually the commons is the alternative to the state. And that's where, you know, some of the differentiate with Marxism, you know, because so much of the Marxism is statist and uh, come in also. They are very different conception of uh, you know, who has the power to make decisions, right? Which does not mean that we should not now struggle you know, to force the state you know, to take, to pass certain laws or to adopt certain policies. Does not mean that, oh, we are going to wait for the commons and now you know, forget about the state. No, on the contrary, I think the construction of the commons occurs, you know, what the commons will look like is established in the process exactly of struggling to in fact force the state to make certain provisions. My concern, you know, whether it is education, healthcare, or any other provision, is that 
we don't have this, I, I think, is either the commons or the state. Rather that in this period in which we don't have the power, you know, which better yet, in this period in which the state still has the monopoly of ownership over the major forms of production, over, over basically the wealth that is produced, right? That in this period, we don't just simply say, okay, um, reproduction, let's, the state will do it. Or uh, the alternative to housework, to domestic work is the state organizes reproduction. You know, childcare, that if we do have state provide the services, we also have the common coming in. We also have people in the community having some struggling to have some decision-making power. There might be a one day that we have a commoning. I know that the Zapatistas have created clinics and those clinics with the aid of doctors who accept to work in that context, right? Have been so good that even people who are not Zapatistas go to the clinic. We, don't, we are not in that situation. We depend on the hospital. We depend on the schools. Does it mean that we allow the hospital, the sanitary system, the school to make all the decision and we expect them to, yeah? And we simply say, oh, pass the right law? I don't think so. I'm against that. I think we should also organize, not easy, particularly when people are working so much, so participation, having a voice in how services are organized has to come together with the struggle to reduce work time, to reduce the working week, right? So obviously macro changes don't happen unless we fight in different realms, unless we join different movements Right? So the movement to have a voice in how sanitary services are provided is a movement that depends on other movements for good food so that we don't get sick, for the uh, labor movement so that we reduce the amount of time we spend and we can actually be present in the communities. Because if everybody comes back at eight or nine o'clock in the evening or so exhausted, you don't go and talk to the teachers. You don't talk to the people organizing the educational system or the sanitary system. So we need to think in a way that is very comprehensive, right? And, uh, but I think as a vision towards the future, the vision is idea to create community who are capable of organizing their healthcare, who are capable of organizing you know, obviously right now, the situation politically, economically is so dire, you know, you're still hearing, you know, the, the drums of war, horrendous, <laughs> but there is a struggle. And I think a lot of people know that uh, unless we start constructing something from below and we start now, you know, we are not going to be able to really to really turn the tide, turn the tide from the very destructive, you know, trajectory in which the world seems to be moving today. I agree with your critique of the state. And I guess I'm just wondering if the state does still have the monopoly um, on managing those, those aspects of, of life that you're talking about. Um, or if maybe we're in a moment where corporations are filling that vacuum to try to um, help people meet those immediate needs that you're describing. And so how the strategy would change when it's not just an alternative to the state, but also to what we're seeing now, which is sort of like corporate managed life, if that makes sense. And if there's any place for like workers cooperative movements in that project too. Yeah, I, I always, I guess in my conception, the state is always the voice of the corporation. 
you know, when I see the Biden administration, which is supposed to be the progressive one, right? totally subservient, totally subservient. And uh, so to me, the state represents collective capital. And, you know, there are occasional some moments of slippage, but fundamentally I see the truth. So yeah, yeah, the corporation are not interested. And that's why we have the, you know, healthcare system, which is a nightmare which is a truly a nightmare. And, uh, you know, the COVID crisis has brought to the, to the light, to the foreground, you know, a crisis that was already there. You know, it wasn't like, uh, you, know, you know, paradise and then all of a sudden COVID. COVID has exacerbated and made visible a crisis that had been there. So all the people excluded, the people who go, the last, uh, you know, period of uh, metastatic cancer because they've not been able to either have the time or the money or the insurance and, and uh, you know, the marketization. So I, I, yeah, I don't see the difference. We're basically all of us researchers in the commons or, and I have a question, what role do we have in the commons as researchers? Very, very important. I mean, I think very, very, very important because it's uh, what kind of work you do and for whom you do it, whom you have in mind when you do your research. And then what do you do on the basis of what you found? You know, when we speak of enclosures, you know, of course the issue of land is the one that comes because the land is the foundation for everything. Without the land, there's nothing else. It's like without human labor. But enclosure extends to knowledge, extends to our bodies, extends to affectivity, right? So enclosure of knowledge. Knowledge today is a commodity. You have to pay to access knowledge, you know? So there's so much, uh, so much, uh, you know, fanfare about uh, all the internet and now we are connected with the world and so on. And now there's this uh, kind of hubris that because we have the internet and so we can talk to somebody, you know, in Asia, we actually understand what is taking place, right? In fact, the period of the internet the period of the digitalization of work has been the period of maximum attack on the world commons. Maximum attack on the what? But digital technology has been a polluter and a eater. You know, Thomas Moore uh, in the 16th century, in front of the enclosure of land in England, you know, when the early capitalists, proto-capitalists, turn pasture and arable land, you know, to pasture for, for sheep and excluded the peasantry. He said, the sheep are eating men. The sheep are eating men. That eating now, the digital economy, the digital production is eating forests. It's polluting rivers. Uh, and, and of course, it's creating all kinds of exclusions, immense amount of exclusion. This, this society has created a division of labor, which is also the creation of hierarchy and division. So, so you have yeah. the, the intellectual workers you know, in their own spaces, and then you have the others who are on the ground. And obviously, the people who are defending the land commons and the forest are those who are most immediately affected by it. But I've been in a number of situations and I've been in a meetings, for example, in Mexico, where there was an alliance made, where, for example, people who were fighting against the throughway, you know, this is one example among others, people who were fighting gained strength in their fight by the fact that they had some researcher, you know, helping them by looking at the broader issue. 
what would be the consequences of the true way, right? What would be the money going into it? Was it really economically necessary or not? Et cetera, et cetera. They were able to provide a kind of knowledge, facts and other that enabled the struggle, right? So they couldn't say only, okay, we are going to build the barricade, we're going to stand, you know, when uh, uh, you know, people are going to come, but they were also able to throw to the media, et cetera, et cetera, begin to create questions, slow down the process. Even slowing down the process at time is very important. Corporations value their time. You know, they will not, if they are stopped, often might give up. So I'm saying a researcher can help a struggle by actually providing the kind of knowledge of the consequences, of the significance, you know? So basically, yeah, we have to break down, we have to, I always say, we have to reunite what capitalism has divided. We have to break down the kind of hierarchy. That's the common, you know? Researchers have to see themselves as commoners. They have to yes. see themselves as commoners so that their information is not privatized or directed only towards certain channels, but is actually giving to people are fighting on the ground. This is, I think, what we need to do. <laughs> we need to, to commonize lang language. We need, we need, for example, to speak in a language, which is not to trivialize. It is not to trivialize. But you know, I discovered because to me, and I think the women's movement, for whatever limits it has had, has been very revolutionary in many ways. One thing that has taught me in the 70s was the need to democratize language. For example, how much we have suffered as women participating in left movements, not understanding what the men were saying, feeling totally stupid and humiliated that we couldn't ask a question because we didn't understand. Later, when we educated ourselves politically, we realized that they didn't have anything special to say, but that there is a language that does not care to make the steps so that everybody can understand that often the difference between a language that people do not understand and one they understand, even when the ideas are the same, is a language, is an effort to explain. Like you say a name, everybody assumes that you know it. No, who is this person? What does he mean, this concept? And then of course, to see what is the relation between what I'm doing and, and what is happening on the ground. How much of what I'm researching and how I'm using what I'm researching is actually being you know, applied, can actually forward you know, the struggle that is taking place you know, for a better society. It is a, a great example that the dialogue between you and Katie Ko about who are the people uh, who are excluded. So the, the question of uh, uh, enclosures and how the state, the current state from the, uh, uh, is actually disempowered by structural adjustment programs and mm -hmm. how that structural adjustment program uh, in the 80s to the present has produced this mass migration and the production of refugees at the gate of Europe. So it's just that the notion of uh, the authentic, uh, to say authentic, uh, as you rightly point out, is not possible for Africa because mm -hmm. of this neoliberal paradigm. And then the new neoliberal paradigm has affected, as you rightly said, the feminism. And so the micro, I would like you to speak about how women have become um, subversively ap uh, appropriated into that machinery of disenfranchisement through the microcredit uh, model. Uh, and 
and, and the production of land reform, where the states, the, the state, whether it is in Africa or Latin America, or even here in the US, uh, communities, indigenous communities, and uh, uh, do not have access to really land. land. Mm -hmm. Even the state does not have the right to land because the, the surface is what the corporation negotiates with uh, the compliance representative of the state. Thank you, Usaina, and uh, always a great pleasure. Usaina and I did a lot of work in the past together and, you know, in analyzing how the restructuring of education in Africa went hand in hand with the restructuring of the global economy and how, in fact, to the restructuring of the education system, you know, which was privatization, et cetera, a new division of labor, a new global division of labor was being organized so that you know, for example, Africans who be destined to become manual workers or, uh, and this kind of division of labor actually could be read, you know, through the restructuring of the, of the educational system. And, uh, and through the intervention, for example, of the World Bank in the educational system, you know, there's uh, so much to say about that, but, you know, we wrote a lot about it. We used to publish bulletins, we published, but you know, your, your, uh, yeah, that question is really very important because uh, you know, first of all, I think the feminist movement, I mean, there's, you know, the more powerful the movement, the more the, you know, uh, a capital, it tries to appropriate it. And I think the feminist movement emerged, you know, at the moment of great capital crisis and a moment in which capitalism internationally uh, had to restructure itself, right? The 70s was a great moment of accumulation crisis, right? And this is when uh, everything has to be changed so that everything remains the same, you know? And feminism was used, you know, celebrating women demand for emancipation so that billions of women are sent into very low paid precarious jobs, right? And, uh, you know, so that, uh, you know, uh, for instance, um, you know, the, the, the support of women's rights is used for military intervention, right? As what has happened in Afghanistan. Now, now apparently the Biden administration doesn't care that the women are starving because they are freezing the money of the Afghan people. So the same women whose uh, educational rights are to be protected, now they can start, but that's okay. <laughs> so the hypocrisy, the, the layers and layers of hypocrisy. Um, so this is important. And uh, I was saying before, you know, structural adjustment, you know, was the Trojan horse, was really the Trojan horse because uh, it came in response to something that was artificially created, you know, the so-called debt crisis. There was really global debt crisis that was created in Washington by the Federal Reserve, raising the interest rate on the dollar, right? So that all the low uh, loans that had been taken by African countries in the name of development, right? In the name of catching up after the decades and century of colonization, you know, all those, all those uh, debts exploded. All those debts exploded. And now they became, uh, you know, debtor, debtor nation. From independent nation, nation entering a new world through independence, now debtor nation still controlled by the IMF who, who go, you know, this kind of nice suited man, they would arrive every month you know, in the capitals with their attache case to look at the books, to look at whether the government, this is colonization, right? This is colonization. And uh, this is what, this is what has enabled, this is what has enabled corporation to enter, you know, the continent because in order to pay the debt, in order to pay the debt, you have to sell your forest. Ghana has sold these forests. In order to pay the debt, you have to allow mining company to come in, take out, bring home the profits, right, et cetera, et cetera. 
you sell the land of Ethiopia, you know, to Saudi Arabia. This is what is happening. This is what is an incredible scandal. You know, entire population have been deprived of their ancestral land or their means of reproduction. This is a scandal. But unfortunately, this is the world that we are facing. You no, know? and uh, we certainly, I think, need to, you know, see that feminism is not one thing. That there are different feminism. You know, I think we have to speak of feminism in the plural, because over the, the decades, a very neoliberal feminism, you know, has grown. That, as we all know, once you know, equality with men have the same right of access for uh, you know, particularly the high sphere, you know, for uh, as you know, equality in a world in which men are being incarcerated, killed, exploited, and so on. It's a very poor world. I think we want something better. We want to actually change this society in a way that nobody is exploited. I just wanted to say, I realized as, um, as I was reading these pieces that almost all of them came out around 2010, 2011. And I was just wondering, since I know that the, you know, the movement of the squares, the 2011, you know, Occupy, 15th of May, Arab Spring were so important to you and kind of what happened afterwards with different groups in, in New York, but really around the world. I was just wondering if you could talk about maybe how, I mean, maybe how those movements have influenced your, your thinking about the commons um, and maybe sort of what you think the legacies of those movements are now about 10 years later. Thanks. Yeah, I think those movements were very important. In fact, uh, you know, I wrote this, uh, published this collection of articles called the Enchanting the World which is based on the idea of the commons and exploring different dimensions of the commons. And one of the last chapter is a chapter on Occupy. You know? And uh, you know, I think the Occupy brought out you know, the, the power of the common because uh, you know, the fact that you know, the, the, the time uh, that uh, all these young people and also people not so young spent together right, you know, created a whole new consciousness, new dimension, new practices. You know, I mentioned in this article, the practice of the assembly, just coming together, you know, and making decision. Um, in New York, for example, the practice of the mic check, right, it was very powerful, it was something very emotional, the mic check, you know, something so simple, you know, that the police, prevented people from using microphones. And so every time somebody said anything, everybody else had to repeat it, you know, verbally until everybody heard it. And so this became this big chorus. It became a big chorus and uh, the sense of the collectivity, there was a feeling of the collectivity, you know, so, so that, uh, even weeks or months after the Occupy was over, you know, people can use in the mic check in other situations, even when they had microphones, right? And then collectively dealing with the reproduction of daily life, keeping the place clean, providing food, making the contact with the farmers, issue of security and health, putting together the library. This was a tremendous experience for many young people who you know, had been used to spend their days in front of a computer, you know, in isolation from each other. And so there was this, this discovery of what a wealth sociality is, what a wealth to speak to each other, the words, the eyes, the gesture, the body, the importance of the body, and how certain things become possible that are not. Certain exchange and affectivity become possible that are not provided, you know, through a, digi a digital means, you know? And so, and then of course the, the whole thing ends and ends because the police was very brutally repressive towards it. 
right? And, uh, but I don't believe, you know, it generated many things. For example, strike debt, you know, the movement against student debt begins with Occupy. You know, strike debt begins with Occupy. And uh, because people talking to each other in the night, they discovered they all had a debt. You know, and uh, they began to see that they could do something. You know, and this has been true of other struggles as well. You know, for example, when afterwards parts of New York were flooded, there were areas of New York that uh, not not Manhattan that were never reached. You know, by by anybody. People were in the dark. They had nothing, no food, et cetera, in the coastal areas, which are very poor areas. And it was those who had organized for Occupy, who went there, who went up the stairs of building that were in the dark, and they brought food, they brought medicine. So there's been, a, there's been an experience, a learning that has had implication long after the end of Occupy. So, you know, I think that this was uh, something that has left, you know, a, a, you know, that is still in people's, in people. And the same thing is a, in, uh, in Spain with the Quinceme, you no, know, with the movement of the square, you no, know. it's not true that this thing dissipate, right? They, they do create new movements, new knowledges. You know? And uh, so, uh, we are looking forward also to you know, new ways in which uh, the, we can begin to reappropriate the public space. Can I and new, way, new ways of being in a public space. I, I wonder if I could ask a follow-up to that, Sylvia, sort mm -hmm. of from the other side, and I should stipulate that I'm, I'm with you. Uh -huh. but, um, some of the ways that you're talking about Occupy or maybe Standing Rock mm -hmm. are also the ways that participants in, let's call it, right-wing protests also describe their experience. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if the occupation of downtown Ottawa, for example, recently, would qualify as a commons, even if we don't like its politics, one thing is that a lot of right wing, uh, um, uh, how do you say, movements, not all, but you know, there are right wing movements who are purely uh, dictated and shaped by the whole story of uh, slavery, who would like back to go back to slavery. And they are, you know, Nazi inspired, and there are people who would like to, you know, enslave uh, black people and others as well, if possible. Um, but I think there's been also experiments that we'll see as uh, right wing, but uh, certainly not progressive, but they have been shaped or enabled by the fact that people wanted to overcome the isolation. The feeling of being very isolated and being very fragile and, and looking for a community. You know, I'm thinking so many like Sinanon, I don't know if Many of you are too young to remember Sinanon, for instance, uh, or to remember the Sinanon was um, a place, a psychology where there was these gurus who were uh, basically uh, presenting a new method of psychology. And lots and lots of people went there. You know, it was a idea of communal living and you're going to be treated of your depression and other problems. In reality, it was also organized in the, as a military camp. And it was organized around, you know, strict discipline, militaristic, et cetera, et cetera. So that people escaped, many escaped and there were horrible stories. The other one was, uh, you know, what it was the, the famous guy who created a colony in Guyana, which eventually they all ended up Thinking poison, they were being actually poisoned. I don't know if you remember. The, the, anyway, so I'm saying the number of the, the question of the isolation and, this, and the state of anxiety and fear in which many people live 
you know, in this society is something that has to be taken into account and why many are attracted to forms of organization that are highly problematic, but nevertheless, you know, attract. This is one story. The other is what happened in, uh, in Ottawa. I don't know what happened on the ground because you see not every coming together has the same dynamic. So the fact of describing and coming together, you find strength and et cetera. I don't know because Occupy had a very particular type of organization. People join, they, they, they join in organizing reproduction, they join in, in assemblies in which it was organized that everybody had the right to speak. It was organized in a way that really attempted to create the possibility of participation for everybody. You know? It had this conflict. You know, at one point, women created certain spaces that they call safe spaces because they felt that there were still matches, there was still a certain amount of machism. So I don't feel confident in speaking as to what really happened. You know. I also want to add a couple of things because I realized I didn't reply completely to what Usena had asked because she had asked me to talk about microcredit. And, uh, you know, uh, it's very important because I come to see microcredit as one way of, of destroying mm -hmm. communities, you know, and, uh, and in fact, this is the way it has functioned. Microcredit has been one way to destroy communities. It's very interesting, you know, it was presented as the solution for, you know, poor women in the third world. And this was a credit to the poor. Yunus was given all kinds of recognitions and so on. This was like the idea of giving a little bit of money to poor women because their poverty presumably was due to the fact that they didn't have that money. And a little money would help them to set a little business. And interesting enough, and here is where the disintegration begins. The money was given to the group, to a group. And uh, each person was made responsible for the payment. If one didn't pay, the other would have to pay. This has created to a very destructive dynamic. First of all, you know, that little money has never resolved, never resolved the crisis. You know, the women who were suffering from, you know, loss of land, you know, immiseration because of, you know, uh, bad economic policies. So the very, you know, it was very difficult for women to pay back the little loans that they would take. At which point the reciprocal policing, because if I, if you don't pay back the loan, right, I will have to pay for you. And so the reciprocal policing, you know, of, well, why did you spend your money buying uh, something for your child? Why did you spend your money? a whole you know, breakdown of the solidarity in these groups. They were actually kept together only by the fact that they had a responsibility for each other for paying back the loans that each individual and the group had taken. You know? So a very perverse system that was in fact celebrated as the solution of poverty in the world. And now we know, now we have much more understanding that the way microcredit was organized, you know, was organized in a way that was extremely, extremely corporate oriented. You know, first of all, right, um, microcredit, the, the, the repayment structure, the repayment was such the women could not organize, use their money to improve land cultivation. 
repayment had to begin after two weeks. That's not the time of any season or any agricultural process. After two weeks, nothing is grown. So slowly, indirectly, through microcredit, right, women were forced to engage in commerce, buying and selling. They were forced to engage in the process of, you know, you buy things from a company and then you resell it in the street. Because in order to repay, they had to earn enough money immediately because they had the repayment started in two weeks. So the, the loss of land, you know, organized very perversely so that it would encourage whatever sale of land had remained, right? Now, secondly, often the, 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 the money was given with the provision, the part of it, you had to buy certain commodities. So in Bangladesh, you know, uh, microcredit companies made a deal with Danone. Danone is the yogurt. And part of their money, a certain percentage, you had to buy yogurt. So even that, right? Third, the women, if they took $100, they were never given all 100. They were given 80. And the reason was, well, these are women who are not used to money. They have been debanked. They are no use. They shouldn't have all. There should be a little reserve. But the interest on the loan was for a hundred. So it was very fraudulent. Fortunately, this is now many years after, and there's been a broad literature, and struggles have begun that have now, you know, uh, corrected the very celebratory image that was given of the microcredit. And now we have a much more, but it was a way of actually, you know, extracting enormous amount of work from women. It was a really a way of disciplining women and exploiting women that had very negative consequences because uh, often the women, instead of lifting out of poverty, lost even the little they had. And often they also lost their friends, their community, because when they were not able to pay the debt, then the other women would begin to be resentful. So this is what I wanted to point out. And I call microcredit, you know, you know a way of a, a tool to undermine the common under the pretense of bringing people together and so on. So the World Bank and the companies used an ancient method that women in Africa and Latin America, it has different names. In Africa, it's called Tontin, which is groups of women come together and they pool resources. Sometimes they put a little money every month. And then when one of them has a need, she takes it, right? Uh, but there was no, no interest rate, nothing. Just women coming together and each day, each month, putting together some something. You know? They use that, but of course they put on it, right? The whole issue of interest, that payment, punishment, terrible punishment. In fact, Usena Alidu told me that in Niger, when a woman doesn't pay, they put a picture on the, on the door of the bank. Imagine they put your photograph on the door of the bank and everybody in the community will know she has not paid, right? In other places, they come into your house and they take even your pots. They reappropriate anything, even the pots that you use to cook rice. You know? So there's a lot of punishment attached. Um, and uh, I say this because uh, on many campuses for years, 
you know, they were representative of these companies. They were raising money, you know, with the idea that all micro credit, we're helping the poor women in Africa, we're helping the poor women in the third world. That's a big lie. Through the readings in your discussion today, the, the two pillars we keep returning to um, are the importance of, of women and, and sort of understanding the gendered aspects of the commons and the importance of land. You know, I, I liked your comment before by land, how much we mean in that one word. Um, but I'm curious if you could reflect a bit upon how your thinking applies to a really important space for the commons, which is aquatic environments, because that is a place where by definition there isn't land. Um, but also historically a place where the gender dynamics, especially in the Western tradition, are so distinct and that they tend, we tend to conceive of um, especially open ocean as a very sort of masculine labor environment. Um, I'm curious if, you, if you've touched upon that at all in your own work or how you would see your, your thought extending to there, especially since, you know, with climate change, this is very much on the agenda. <laughs> Yeah, no, you're, you're very right. Actually, you know, I haven't had, because my life lately has been quite um, um, agitated, <laughs> but there is a, a book has come out about the law, the sea and capitalism that looks very interesting. I'm really curious to see. Yeah, you know the book, right? Yes, and the, I've, I've skimmed through it and it's really, very, very. So the sea has been uh, privatized you know, not perhaps as much as the land, but almost, right? So we now have all this part of the sea taking over the coastal area for farming, right? Fish farming, the massive pollution that fish farming, you know, has created. First of all, the privatization of the sea has proceeded tremendously with the, with the farming, right? And the pollution, you know, and everything. And, uh, and also with this law of the sea, you know, that uh, allows government to, in fact, you know, have a larger span, a large a control over a larger span of water, you know, and that way is really a form of privatization. And in fact, there's been a tremendous amount of struggle across the globe, you know, from fishermen, fisherwomen communities, and so on. And about the gender issue, the gender issue is very important because I think more and more, and um, as you probably know, globally, there is a Fisher People's Movement. They began in India about 20 years ago, and, but they now has expanded. And it's, called the, it's not called any longer a fisherman movement. It's called the Fisher Movement, Fisher People, because the workforce you know, of the fishing is more and more female. And whereas on the boat, when they go to the high seas, it's still predominantly male, though not exclusively, but predominantly male. All the work of cleaning and bringing to, and bringing to the market is done by women. Really the provisioning and the, and the, and the management you know, of fish once it is gathered and it has to be brought to the market, and there has been many of the struggle of fisher people have been conducted by women. For example, mm. you know, to make sure that they can take a bus in many community in India, et cetera, for example, the ability to take a bus with the fish, they would not allow them so that uh, the bus, because they said the bus should stink. And that meant they had to walk. And walking, the fish arrived and it was not fresh anymore. So they, they actually, uh, Maria Rosa de la Costa, who has written this famous uh, essay on, uh, on the, the, the became the foundational document of wages for housework, has also written a book that I translated called Our Mother Ocean, Our Mother Ocean, uh, published by Common Notions. And this was a number of years ago. That book needs to be updated, but it's a very important book because it tries to do for the sea what is being done for the land. In other words, a lot of discussion about the land and land struggle, land, land movements, 
land, but very much less about the sea. And she's pointing out that the sea instead, you know, we have to begin to see that the two cannot be separated, right? And um, so, yes, we, we need, that's a very important question. I live in a village where people have known each other for generations. Mm. And they have, and I'm, I'm very privileged to say that I learned more from them than I had ever learned before. And one of the things that struck me was conviviality, yes. to live with someone. Yeah. And this goes back in time, it goes into the present and it also goes into the future. Yeah. And I'm wondering if others have experienced this as well. Yeah. Which is, and this transcends and it goes into all the commons. Mm. not only one. Yeah, I want to comment on this book that Gladys Tsutsul, uh, who is a Guatemaltecan sociologist, anthropologist, uh, has written on, uh, is, is in, I, I expect it to be soon published in English, it's all indigenous system of government. She's in Guatemala and uh, speaks about the highland of Totonicapan. And she structured the book by looking at uh, how whole community was able to preserve their communal land for 500 years, despite the multiple, multiple attacks, you know, waged against it. So she looks at, the, at how it is organized, work and production, and it's very, interesting because she describes a world where institutions emerge, you know, they are not on top of the reproduction structure, but they emerge from the very uh, organization of everyday reproduction of life. But what she also, when she looks at the institution that have enabled this uh, you know, ability to maintain the land and the community. One of the things that she looks at, the assembly, you know, the collective decision-making. Uh, she looks at the recorrido when the, you know, structures where you, you go around the perimeter of your land and you basically strengthen relation with all the people that are around. And then she looks at the festival the fiestas, no? And uh, which are good is to have a good time, is conviviality. But she's pointing out that there's always something more, which is the fiesta is always a moment in which people recommit themselves to the community. It's a way of always saying, yes, we are part. Yes, we are responsible for each other. Yes, we care for each other. You know, we are not only interested in our individual, you know, success or prosperity, but we have a, a, a commitment to, to the common, right? And so the fiesta, and she's saying this is why people spend so much time. You know, sometimes some work a year figuring out what we are going to do for the fiesta, et cetera, because it's seen as a moment in which uh, you make a statement about your being in the community. And that I think is also what produces the, the conviviality. I think ending on conviviality uh, is a great place, even over Zoom, um, this has felt like a convivial space. I know. Um, uh, mostly Sylvia, because of you, <laughs> because of your wonderful presence and also because of your your work, which we have enjoyed reading and engaging with so very much. Okay, okay. all the best all right. to all, and yes, yes, see you next, bye. Bye-bye.